Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're going to worship the Lord this evening because he's worthy of all the praise. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. God is still here. He's with you. Come, come let us adore him.
We welcome you to tonight's study, and uh, we're going to talk about family and relationships, things of that sort, especially since we are uh, at home and we're with family and friends. The Lord placed this message on my heart, and we'll see how it fits into uh, your personal lives and personal experiences. I, As I was studying these scriptures, I didn't even know how this may fit into all the things that we've been saying beforehand, but I believe that there's someone that uh, God is wanting to reach through this particular message and through the things that he placed in my heart. So let's pray as we enter into this time of study. Father, thank you so much for your word, your truth that transform our lives and that which help us to see truth and help us to walk in the truth that we see. So I pray that the words of my mouth and the things that you have me meditate upon would be pleasing in your sight and it would be edifying to the hearers and those that are with us tonight on this study. We give you the honor, praise, and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to talk about Connected by Kinship is the title I'm using for tonight's study, Connected by Kinship. And uh, I, I want to begin with the scripture here in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Uh, it's a passage of scripture, I believe, that's really helping us as believers to understand God's objective. Paul said here, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, Paul said, first of all, he says, as we have been given the opportunity of the grace of God that is upon our lives, God graces us that's when we afforded the opportunity to participate in what he is doing. He said, out of that, let us do good and look at the comprehensive approach towards goodness. He said, let us do good to all. But then he goes into a specific and he says, especially, especially, he highlights a particular group of people. And he said, and those people are those who are of the household of faith. We're going to talk about connected to kinship. What does this mean? As we are the household of faith, we are a people that are joined together by spirit and we are held together in bonds of love. But the subject, uh, subjects addressed in the message is often determined by the interests of the speaker. Things that the speaker is interested in are subjects that the speaker will uh, primarily address. As we're led by the Spirit, the things that I've meditated upon, the things that I have uh, considered, I focused upon, let's say these are things that I would say central to my concentrate, concentration and consecration are usually the things that God will begin to speak to give me answers so that I'm able to give answers to those of you that uh, will receive from me what God has uh, to say through me. And, and, and with all the things that's happening in this day and hour, I mean, uh, this is a day of chaos and confusion, a day where things are very disturbing. And, and, and as a result of that, we have a lot of questions about what is taking place. And I tell you, as a pastor, my mind has been working overtime and, and, and asking these questions, Lord, what should we uh, say and what should we do in times like these? And then the other part, this is when a message is important and why a person or say I would preach a particular thing and another may not address the same issue is because uh, we look at the uh, we have invested interest in a subject matter. In other words, it's putting this way, I got some skin in the game. So when it deals with people of color, when it deals with the church, when it deals with issues uh, that uh, uh, apply to people that I'm familiar with or people that are part of me, then by all means, it, uh, it, it gains special interest. And I highlight those things over and above everything else. Now, we talk about interest. There are varying degrees of interest because a person, there are some things that are interesting and uh, or interest me and interest others that we, they're still interesting to us, but they don't have the same level of interest as other things. But then there are things that they're primary in our lives. But here the scripture helps us to understand. He says, therefore, as we have opportunity, this is the broad stroke. Let us do good to all. 
which means that we don't just look at those areas where we are directly affected in our people that we know that are affected by things that are happening. The Bible gives us an uh, all-inclusive approach. He says, let us do good to all. When we have been given the opportunity, let us do good to all. But then we get to the special interest. He says, uh, especially to those who are of the household of faith. In other words, when a person becomes a part of the household of faith, then that becomes a special interest group. We are particularly concerned about what is happening within the church. The position of the church, the direction of the church, how we as a church are addressing certain matters, what uh, positions are we taking, and if we take the right position, we are applauding that. If we take the wrong position on a matter, then by all means, we are affected by the positions that's that's taken. And in this, we talk about the broad stroke, it has to do with the whole body of Christ, and I would say beyond the body of Christ, Christendom, how the church is viewed, how people see us, affects us, because you understand people uh, will begin to generalize uh, the church based upon some activity that may be taking place in and through and by others. So in this, we have varying degrees of interest, but then let's look at our vested interests. We look at the things that we ought to pay very close attention to. I'm interested in the church, but then in addition to that, I'm interested in African Americans, uh, how we are uh, postured in relation to the church. I'm interested in that. What position are we taking? in relation to the church? Are we doing what God has called us to do within the whole of what the whole body of Christ? Now, now in this, uh, I'm going to talk about how God views his people or uh, views us and his people and also how we view uh, us and, 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 and the people. Uh, what, what God calls it, he calls it, he calls us my people. He says, my people, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. If my people will, will do such and such, if my, these are my people, you shall be my people. Uh, you shall be called by my name. So the Lord begins to identify with us and he brings us in the place where we identify with him. He used terms like, these are my people. Now, uh, let's look at how we use the same terms in relation to others. Because we look at one of the things, uh, I would say as African-Americans, we call uh, the, the brothers, and, and uh, uh, may call them soul brothers, and others soul sisters. These are terms that we use, terms of endearment that we use in relation to one another. This is my, bro- this is my soul brother. This is my soul sister. But then we take it into a, a, uh, a, a larger audience within the church. I came from a holiness church. I uh, was, was baptized in the Holy Spirit in the holiness church. And in the holiness church, they had this saying. They say, praise the Lord, saints. And when they say, praise the Lord, saints, this was a specific group of people that qualified to have that term of, of uh, addressing them. So, so in other words, it's saying that if you say, praise the Lord, saints, it said, I recognize you as being one of the brothers or one of the sisters within the church. And, and that's really the greeting, praise the Lord, saints. And we've come back, they said, praise the Lord. I learned differently in, in Africa. They said, we said, praise the Lord, saints. You don't just say what they said back, you say, Hallelujah. You praise the Lord. You give language to the, the, the request that was made. Now, in that, we begin to look at even other ways of grouping. My people, my people. Who are the fraternities? We understand frat brothers and uh, sororities. Uh, this is my frat brother. This is my sorrow sister. These are ways where people connect and they look at how they are connected and, and joined together. And as a result of it, the Bible speaks of special interests especially to those who are the household of faith. There are benefits uh, derived. There are uh, are, uh, advantages gained by being connected in these particular uh, organizations among themselves now. And and the same thing applies within the body of Christ, within families and the like. But, but, But look at what we begin to look at the scripture and we begin to look at the story of Cain and Abel. And you know the whole story where Cain 
uh, sacrifice to the Lord, and Abel sacrificed to the Lord. One gave the fruit of the ground, the other gave the fruit of his cattle, his livestock. That's what Abel sacrificed. And uh, the Lord was pleased with Abel's sacrifice, but he was displeased with Cain's sacrifice. So you know the jealousy that rose in the heart of Cain to the degree that he slew his brother Abel. Now understand, let's look at this. He slew his brother Abel. There was kinship. We say connected to kinship. He was connected to him as a result of being his brother. And, and to be honest, his only brother. All he had is a father, mother, and a brother. But Cain slew his brother Abel. And then what happened after killing his brother, the Lord began to ask him the question. He says, where is Abel, your brother? He asked the question, where is your brother? In other words, he says, where is your kinfolk? Where is the person that you're joined to, the person that ought to be getting benefits out of the relationship, out of how they are, were connected? There ought to have been some benefits derived from this. But instead of that, he killed his brother Abel. But watch Cain's response to that, to the Lord now. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? Was the way Cain responded to God. He says, in other words, am I responsible for my brother? Now understand, the truth of the matter is that Cain was looking out for himself. He had entered into a degree of jealousy which uh, lended itself to selfishness. So therefore, as far as kinship was concerned, he did not see him, even though he called him my brother, because if he was, in fact, seeing him as his brother, he would recognize the fact that he was his brother's keeper. But in other words, but instead of being his brother's keeper, he became his brother's murderer. He became his brother's murderer. So in this, the point we're making here is that we can get to the place when we aren't rightly connected or we don't recognize the connection that people that God has placed within our lives can become expendable. They can be at a place where you can easily dismiss them and go on about your business, but oftentimes it's because of some kind of wound that you carry within your, in your own soul that will bring you to the place of, of, of dismissing yourself from one that God has brought you into relationship with. And that's something we have to search our hearts concerning. It, 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 it's, it's, where is the disconnect? God produced the connection, but what brought about the disconnect? The Bible says, that which God has joined together, let no man put asunder, let no thing or no situation uh, cause a divide to occur within the relationship. Is what We can take it beyond marriage, we can take it to any relationship that uh, God has actually orchestrated. So in this, he says, uh, uh, am I my brother's keeper? The disconnect brought up, uh, uh, actually caused murderous intentions to enter into his heart to the degree that he slew his brothers, his, his own brother. Now, 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 in that, let's begin to look at how this kind of thing, we look at Cain and Abel, see the stories, but let's look even at how the same thing is repeated time and time again in the lives of individuals on an ongoing basis. Not maybe, maybe not to that degree, but we can have murderous intentions in the heart, or we can have a, 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 a dismissing one another, be at a place where we no longer value the other person, the individual that God has placed. We can no longer receive from one another. Those kinds of things are in the same category. The devil doesn't have any new tricks, but he just bring the, he just repackaged the old tricks, and he began to play them over and over again. So in this, we begin to see, even when people begin to look at, we talk about brotherhood, but we look at uh, mankind in, uh, let's say, do good to all. The Bible says do good to all. The opposite of this is when we don't see them as people at all, but we see them as those people. We see them as those people. Uh, we talk about them and us. And usually when we talk about them and us, is usually them against us or us against them. When that divide occurs, usually it's it's a silent war. If it's not if it's not a war, 
that's that's actually uh, declared between uh, the two parties. And even in that, when we get to that place of having us and them attitude, let me tell you something, even though there may be uh, expressions of, of affection, but it's really pretentious love, uh, is, is when you can't find common ground, then uh, you, you end up pretending as if you love one another. But the truth of the matter is that there are things within the heart of that individual that's hindering him or her from giving full expression to the love that God intends to be expressed between the two. Uh, the Bible talks about us being offsprings of God. We're his offspring. Uh, and, and, and understand there's a difference between being an offspring and being a child of God. And offspring, I think about that word offspring. Think about it for a moment. Offspring, that means we were brought forth from or sprung forth from God. We as offspring, in other words, we were derived from God, but yet, and I put it this way, we were offshoots, but no longer rooted. We can be, you see, we can be his offspring, but yet not be rooted in him. You see, uh, in other words, he can become our point of departure, but your life can be lived uh, in, in, to, to make a different point. What point are you making? And understand when you are uh, a child of God, then the objective is to express the will of God. There's something that you've received from God that you are giving full expression to. Now, understand, we talk about Cain and Abel. It started with God, and it started with God. Then you see uh, Adam and Eve, and God's intention for Adam and Eve was to be completed, was to be continued through Cain and Abel, and then Abel's children, Cain's children, and then their children's children, all the way to us. God's intentions never change. But understand, it is passed from generation to generation. So what God does we talk about offsprings, uh, we can be a people that started, we came forth from a particular source, but yet we're not carrying out God's agenda. And I'm going to tell you something, even if your parents were not godly, if your parents did not uh, uh, surrender their hearts and their lives to the Lord, we have to go beyond what they might have done and go back to God's original intent, even though they might have missed it. You don't have to miss it, but you have to grab hold of what God intended to see happening within your household so that it can be carried forth to the next generation and generations to follow. But understand, you talk about a chip off the old block. And the thing is, you talk, it, when you talk about a chip off the old, old block, it's not saying that you're a clone, uh, uh, necessarily a clone of the person that you came forth from, because there's still an expression that's going to be uniquely yours. But there are certain characteristics, there are certain attributes, there are things that have been instilled within the individual that they carry forth. And that's what we talk about. We talk about uh, uh, the whole thing of from one generation to the other. Now, let's look at uh, 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 the family of God. He talks about my people. That's what God calls them, my people. See, God defines it as uh, he calls them my people because they were children of Abraham. If you begin to look at the origin of it all, it was the faith of Abraham that was really the, the, the root of all of it. Abraham had faith. The truth of the matter is that uh, he was from, you see, he became this a man and from faith to a nation. Because you see, it started with faith. Because Abraham, uh, Abram, before he became Abraham, was of the heir, heir of the Chaldeans. He was a Chaldean. So, so in that, we begin to see that was his identity, the Ur, he was from the Chaldeans. And the Chaldeans at that particular time were uh, pagan worshipers. But look what happened. It was the faith of Abraham. That faith that Abraham had started a new nation. A nation was born out of the faith of Abraham. So as a result of Abraham's faith, Abram's faith then, who became Abraham, then we begin to see the seed of Abraham. The seeds of Abraham now became a nation. And we see them as the children of Israel, the children of Israel of the Jewish nation. And, and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob, who became Israel, you begin to see the whole lineage. And as a result of that seed being carried on, now we begin to see a nation being birthed out of, uh, this, uh, from a person that exercised faith. So now, as we begin to look at the, 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 I would say, the continuum 
that occurs even in people become, not being those people, but becoming my people. Look at what Paul said, even concerning uh, the Jewish people, because in this, I would say he carried his heart, this, this desire, this passion, this longing for the people that were of the Jews. Now understand, uh, uh, he was actually called to minister to the Gentiles, but, but he says in Romans chapter nine and verse one, he says, I tell, I, I, I tell the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. He said, if I wish that I myself were cursed for Christ, for my brethren, this is his heart now. You got to hear his heart cry. He said, I wish, uh, and my conscience is not, is bearing witness, I wish uh, that, that I was even a curse for Christ, from Christ, for my brother. In other words, let's put it this way. I would much rather miss it than my brothers miss it. Now, that's a lot of love, isn't it? He says, I love them so much that if it was between me making it and them making it, I'd much rather they make it or, uh, rather than me. And, and understand, that's really the heart of Christ, is putting others before yourselves. He, say, he says, I, 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 I want them to, to get this thing. I want them to understand this. In other words, he carried the burden for his own people. And, and that's what I was talking about. We look at our kinship. We carry the burden for our kinship. We ought to carry the burden for our kinship. We ought to be in a place to say, look, it bothers me when I see things happening and, and, and I see uh, our, our, let's say, people of color acting up. It disturbs me. It ought to disturb me. It ought to disturb you when we see that. Not, not trying to look, uh, come up with excuses for it, but it ought to shake you uh, when you see things happening the way they're happening. He, he says, so now this is what happened, especially those who are going out, trying to find their own way and do their own thing. Now, now we talk about people in general. Let's speak of it specifically in our households. Let's speak of it in our own families, all of that. It ought to disturb you when you see these things happen. He says, so now my countrymen, according to the flesh, these are the ones that I would much rather be a curse for Christ if they would be saved. Then he goes on to say, that who are Israelites, to whom pertain, and then he brings up six things here that I want you to pay attention to. He says, one, the adoption. He's pertaining to the adoption. He said, recognizing that God had uh, given them, uh, graced them the opportunity uh, to come into the family. Then he says, the glory. As far as pertaining to the adoption, number two, the glory. Number three, the covenants. Number four, the giving of the law. And number five, the service of God. And then number six, the promises. Look at all of these. He says, he says, this is why I really want, it, it, I, I, I'm warning them to get it because it pertains to the adoption. And then being, we look at the adoption, but then we look at the glory that would come. Then we look at the covenants because we realize that God entered into covenant with his people. Then he says, the giving of the law. The law was first given uh, to, to the Jews. You see, it was given by Moses, Moses being the lawgiver, it was given to the Jews. And then he says, so with that, we see the service of God. So they're the ones, if these things have been given, they're the ones that have been given the opportunity to serve uh, first and foremost. And then he goes on, even in service, he said the promises. So now we begin to see the promises that God has made towards them. And understand, there are uh, exceedingly great and precious promises that God has made to his people. We see it to the Jews first, but it's also to all of us now who are brought in. He says, of whom are the fathers from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. Now we see Christ coming through the Jewish lineage, who is over all the eternally blessed God, that he says, amen. So, so we begin to look at how God used, uh, this is a heart that, Paul had, even though he sent to the Gentiles, he had a heart for his own people. And the same thing, and I'm going to show you now, we got to be very careful that we don't get to this place of, 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 of prejudice in relation to that. I'll get to that after a while, but understand we look at things, people we have things in common with. Uh, we have things in common and, and then things are in common with. These are people that we want to see grasp hold 
of that which would bring us into a greater level of having things in common. I want to share what I have with you. I want to share. That ought to be the attitude. How can I share what I've come to know, what I've come to understand with those who look like me, act like me, and think like me, or, or ought to think like me, you see? Now, now understand, we talk about identity. You, you see, we ad identify as such. You, you see, we identify with, with, with people, but, but not to justify behavior, as I mentioned earlier, early on, but desiring the best for them because of the fact that we see ourselves as being a part of them. Now, now, now we talk about, I'm speaking of people uh, that we can identify culturally, but I, I'm going to take it beyond cultural identity. We look at cultural identity as one, but then there's a country or national identity. You see, we could say Americans, my people, my people. Yes, it's okay to, 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 to be concerned about your nation. My people, these are my people. When we, even though my people, my, my, my ancestors were brought over here as, as slaves, but yet now I was born in America, so therefore Americans are my people. So whatever happens to America, it happens to me. So these are my people. You are my people. Whatever uh, culture you may be a part of, you are still my people. And then let's take it even beyond that. The human race, the human race, those that breathe air, those that have skin on them, you are part of the human race. You're my people. There's something we have in common. You breathe in the same air I breathe. The same sun shines over you that shine over me. The same moon, the same stars. We are in the same environment right now. The things that's happening to us here at this particular juncture is happening to us at the same time. So we have that in common. So if anything, that ought to draw us closer together. Why? Because we're sharing experiences together. And that's what happens. So now, as we begin to look at these particular things that are happening, we begin to see even what Paul was saying, that our hearts are, are crying out for the people that we share, that, that we do life with, the people that we share life with. And we look at common interests. Now, now mine as a pastor, I really... Uh, began to look at the church and pastors and the like. Some people would say that I need to mind my own business, stay in your lane and that kind of stuff. I said, but if you are a church in the city of Metro Atlanta or church, period, let me tell you something. I, I feel a connection to some degree to you. And 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 if you are, uh, uh, you know, a lot of times I, I stand to be corrected, but also I, I just can't sit back and allow things to happen without opening my mouth and acting like certain things are not taking place. Why? Because I look at it as a whole. You're my people. You're my, whether you accept me or not, you're still my brother. You're still my sister. And understand, we're still in this thing together. And, and we're viewed as the church, regardless of how many divisions may reside among us. One of the things, when I moved into the community, I, I, I knocked on some doors. There was a, a Church of Christ down the street. There is a Church of Christ on the street. And then there's a Primitive Baptist Church. I went to both churches, knocked on the door, because I wanted to meet the neighbors. I wanted to meet those who call the name of the Lord and let them know that I'm coming into the community. Uh, you see, because what happens, I said, when people pass by, they say, they see church and the identity church is church. We started what's called Fellowship of Metro Atlanta Churches. Why? Because uh, I recognize the fact that we needed to be connected as I needed to be connected with other believers and I could not be a lone ranger when it came to the things of God. Now, as we begin to look at uh, identifying with others and understanding this, carrying their pain and, and bearing their burdens, all of this is a part of, of, of what we're talking about. And the Bible helps us understand even, but, but, but yet there is a call, particularly to those who are, I would say, directly connected to us. Those who are directly connected. Right now I'm preaching to uh, I'm sharing with all of you. There, there are people that are watching us uh, in other parts of the world. I trust they are other parts of the world. I trust there are people in other cities that are watching. And there are people right here in Metro Atlanta that are watching. But, but understand, I have a particular responsibility for members of Cross Culture Church. I, I'm, I'm concerned about everybody, but I have a special interest. There is a particular interest to members of Cross Culture Church, as it would be uh, I, have a, I have a special interest. I'm a walker and I'm the father of, of children. So I have a special interest 
in the lives of my own children. Their well-being uh, is important and very significant to me, and it it it, it is paramount uh, to to all the others. So so now, if we look at it, the Bible even says in First Timothy chapter five verse eight, it says, "But if anyone does not provide for his own," and then he says, "And especially for those who are of his household." We talked about the household of faith earlier. He said, "Not provide for his own household." He has already denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So it is saying that, uh, uh, so, so in other words, to the place that we are providing, we are making sure that the provisions are there. We have to be at a place where we are making sure that what is needed among those who are dependent upon us, that we are there to provide those things, those necessities. He says, so if you do not provide those necessities, he, he says, he says, and especially for those, uh, first of all, your own. When it says your own, that, that, that becomes even a broader stroke because your own may be your mother, your father. It could be, uh, it could be a cousin, a niece or nephew, because I understand that's still a part of your family. But then it says, but those in your household, then that's the father, mother, children, uh, and those that live within the household. He said, if you do that, if you do not provide for them, you have denied the faith. You have denied the faith. In other words, we talk about the faith of Abraham. You have actually, uh, through your lack of activity, your lack of, of, of taking on that responsibility, you've denied the faith. So you can talk about the faith of Abraham all you want, but there's no demonstration of that faith that you provided. And he says that he's worse than an unbeliever. So, so, so let's look at what we're talking about here. When we talk about those who are kin to us, they mirror, uh, they are the mirrors through which we see ourselves. They are the mirror through which we see ourselves. We see ourselves through the mirror of those that are uh, directly uh, uh, joined to us. In that, they are the reflection of self. You see, because what you've done, you have, uh, the objective is for them to be a reflection of self and, and to mirror those things, because what happened, you've poured into them and, and, and what they are de being developed into becoming are the things that you are instilling or you have instilled within them. And you desire to see that reflection. The same thing as it is with Christ. Now that we are born again, we are members of the body of Christ. Jesus want to see, God want to see the reflection of his son in us. We want to look like Christ. When Christ looks at us, he want to see his reflection. So, so now there's something in you that reflects what resides. We talk about children. There's something in you that resides within me. We deal, deal with our children. We deal with church. You see, those that have been taught by me. There's something in the people that's been taught by me that, 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 that which resides in me is reflected in them. Uh, you see, you see I, I can tell pretty much when I go to, I see different individuals, you can pretty much tell where they've been taught of the people they've been around based upon uh, the language that they use, the, uh, you see, the greetings and, and, and even their mannerisms oftentimes could tell you where they came from. And you can say, you must be uh, from such and such a church. You must be one of them. You must be, you see, because, and I say one of them, not in a uh, demeaning way or, or, or condescending way, but you must be one of those connected to this particular group of people. Why? Because we begin to see the reflection of their leader in them, which is a good thing. So in that, we begin to see that, uh, but uh, uh, we talk about that reflection, but let's look at what we're talking about. This is what Paul was talking about. He wanted to see it within uh, the Jews. The potential for greatness is there. The potential for greatness is there. Because if God would place anything good in me or good in you, then the I would say the potential for, for, for that to also is also there to be developed within those that are joined to you. In other words, God didn't just give it to you for you. He gave it to you so that it could become widespread, so that others can develop. And I would say even beyond where you are, but you will be the basis of the foundation uh, of the instructions given and the lives that they are building upon. He says, so now the potential for greatness, but also the propensity for sin. The propensity to sin, you see, is also there. You, uh, 
they can pick up your bad habits, but also they can walk away from that which you have instilled within them. Let's say the Bible says, train up a child in, uh, in the way he should go, and when he's old, he should not depart from the training. He should not depart from the training. And I would say, I would say he would not depart from the way, but he might, he cannot depart from the training. In other words, it is a steal with that individual to do better and to see things differently, whether they do it or not. So, so with that, uh, understand that the, I would say the duality of sin is missing the mark of the instructions given and also missing the mark of God's high calling. It's doing your own thing. It's your thing. Do what you want to do. So now, as we begin to look at, uh, I, I'm dealing with it from a relational point of view, but then we begin to see the relationship that Jesus Christ has with us. In, in John 10, uh, you know, we know John 10, 10, which of the, uh, uh, our, our, you know, he's come to give us life more abundantly, but he, he gets before that. He says in verse two, he says, but, but he who enters into, uh, by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. He said to him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. Listen to what he says. The sheep hear his voice and he calls, listen to this, his own sheep by name and lead them out. He didn't call everybody. In other words, he will call, he didn't call everybody. He called his own sheep. And when he called, in other words, he know your name and he will call you by your name. And he called you by your name to lead them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. Now, now let's stop before that because we got to take another verse of scripture where it says, my sheep hear my voice and know my voice and a stranger they will not follow. But this scripture says that when he speaks, the sheep hear his voice. In other words, that which belongs to the shepherd, their ears are tuned to the voice of that shepherd that's leading them. In other words, when the shepherd speaks, the sheep will hear the voice. There can be a lot of shepherds out there, but when that shepherd that's leading them speak, then it will arrest their attention. That's really strange. See, you can see a lot of sheep. Let's get a picture of this. They're all grazing together. Your sheep and, and other sheep, all these sheep together. And then the shepherd comes in and he begins to call. And when he calls, understand his voice separates the sheep. The sheep that's a part of his fold from the other sheep. Then the other shepherd calls. And it's not a matter of trying to pick out which sheep belong to me, which sheep belong to him or, or the other. It's a matter of the voice of the shepherd that will call his sheep. And he calls the sheep by name and his sheep will hear his voice. He calls his sheep by name and then he will lead them out. Uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and when he brings out his own sheep, not every sheep, but his own sheep, he goes before them. He don't just send them out, but he'll go before them. And the sheep follow him. They follow his lead. They follow his direction. They're not at a place where they're they're trying to argue uh, and, 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 and match wits. But what happens, they, yes, they want to get understanding, but they understand that there's a respect because they hear his voice, for they know his voice. I, I would say when they say he know his voice, they're familiar with his character. They know the quality, the character of the shepherd that's leading them. They know that the shepherd has their best interests at heart. Because the sheep will follow, sheep is a follower, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. When they hear that voice, they heard the voice, but that voice is unfamiliar, so they run away from it. So Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. They didn't understand the depth of it, but there is a depth to that particular statement that uh, they had yet to understand. And then the Lord let them understand later on. He let them know that his mission was to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel, of the house of Israel. He said he was called uh, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Not to everybody, he said, uh, he said but he was called to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, now understand his objective is to win the world. God so loved the world 
But his mission at that particular point was to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, now, now I'm getting to where I want to go here because we begin to see how he carried out his mission. Let's, let's look at it. He started with the lost sheep of the tribe. In other words, it goes right back to the scripture, taking care of your own and then making sure that your own. As you say, what happens? My greatest joy is not going out and ministering before congregations all over the world. I do that in other congregations. My greatest joy is ministering to my own congregation because I realize this is my first and foremost responsibility. But now we begin to see something about, I, I would call this the sin of familiarity. The sin of, in other words, you put your best foot forward. You pour your life into those that are closest. That's where God would have you to pour your life into those that's closest. And, and it says here in first, uh, in St. John 1, 11, he says he came to his own. This is what happened. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. He was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. So he came to his own, but they rejected him. Now understand this. He came to his own, his own rejected him. But understand that rejection, I'm so glad, was not 100%. See, that's the challenge of it all. He came to his own. Now, now, now let me, I, I'm hearing something here. He is saying that those that are his will hear his voice, but he came to his own. But his own did not hear his voice. Let me tell you something. When he says, now we're dealing with the, let's say, those who are born of Abraham, and then those who are really of the seed of Abraham. We're dealing with two different things. They were part of the nation of Israel. But now we're looking at those who are of the seed of Abraham. And, 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 and we can't get the two confused because there are many that try to justify themselves based upon their pedigree. And it's, I'm not a bastard. I'm not a, uh, a illegitimate child because uh, Abraham is my father. But yet he's not going to raise up from these rocks, these stones, sons of Abraham. But, but, but here's what happened here. He came to his own. His own rejected him. And, and I'm going to make a real strong point here after a while. His own rejected him, but it wasn't all, it wasn't 100 percent. But as many as received him, he gave them the right to be called to become children of God. Now we begin to see he came to his own, but now his own became not offsprings. But now they became children of God uh, to those who believe in his name, who were born. They had to be born not of blood nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So now we begin to see, even though they were born uh, within, uh, from the lineage of Abraham, but they could not be called children of God, lest they were born again. They were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So in other words, we're saying, even though you might have been Jewish by 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 uh, flesh in the flesh, you still are not a child of God. You are an offspring of God, lest you're born again. And that's what he's really making. He says, so now it is really according to the will of God, and we're born again. We it it is grace by faith that we are uh, born again. So now this is what happened. We said he went to his own. His own rejected him. And we begin to see even how the Lord identified relationships, how the Lord identified relationships, where it was different from how people identify relationships. We said he came to his own, his own rejected him. He uh, was, uh, uh, let's say Mary was his mother. Joseph was his stepfather. But yet when we go to Matthew chapter 13, and verse 53, you'll see what happened. It said, it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there when he had come to his own country. He taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, he said, why did this man come get all this wisdom and these mighty works? Now watch what they did. They began to look at his place of birth as being and his family of origin based on what they saw. They said, wait a minute. Is this not the carpenter's son? And it's not Mary, the mother, uh, his mother called Mary. And he said, and his brothers, James, Joseph, uh, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? 
Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. Now listen to this now. Now we're talking about people that knew Christ according to the flesh were offended at him. And he says, so now we're talking about the neighborhood. Now we're talking about the hood. He came into his hood, the hood Nazareth. And we recognize that his own brothers and sisters weren't converted until after he died. So among his own, he was having a rough time. So it says, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. He said, he said, uh, he said there's honor in many other places. He said, but the place where honor was lacking was among his own people, his own country and his own house. He said, because of the sin of familiarity, they took for granted many things that Christ was all about. They saw his wisdom, they heard his wisdom, and they saw his mighty works, but yet they reduced it, uh, minimized it because of the sin of familiarity. And he says, prophets of honor here. He says, so as a result of it, they were shortchanged. He did not do many mighty works there because of the unbelief. So they did not get the uh, benefits that could have been derived if they had comprehended who he was and not according to the flesh, but after the spirit. So, so, so now, as we look at this, uh, what would, I would say, what would contribute to this thing? Because people who, uh, let's say they see so much of the same and and, and, and they see it, it becomes so common to them. They say people, even, even ministering the word of God, you realize that the truth of God, the Bible talks about the word of God being rightly divided, rightly dividing the word of truth. But in our day and time, it's a rarity. It's a rarity for the word of God to be rightly divided, for a person to take the interest, to dig into the word of God and to begin to apply their lives to it because people are so busy doing so many other things. But what will bring a person to the place where they can reject even when the word of God is rightly divided and they begin to look for something else because people desire something different. They look for something different. They get tired of the same old, same old. You know, it was in, in, the, in the wilderness, they were eating manna. The manna was sufficient to, uh, to, to preserve them for the whole journey, but they wanted some quail. And I would say, they wanted to go to a buffet. They wanted some variety within their lives. And as a result of it, they say, look, I, I was, I, in, and, and one of the biggest challenges that preachers have is uh, with preachers' PK, uh, PKs is because I, I see it across the board. Many PKs have a difficult time uh, dealing with uh, what their fathers and mothers are standing for and what they're trying to instill within them is because they said, I was raised here. And it's all this church in the morning, church in the evening, church at night, everything, Jesus, this, Jesus, that, the Bible, and such and such and such. I want a life that's different. And they go out and want to sow their wild oats and do their own thing and that kind of thing. So they desire something different. And another thing that will cause a person to walk away is uh, being fascinated by what appears to be uncommon. Because something that's uncommon oftentimes is very fascinating. People are fascinated by things that are unusual. But a lot of times it's unusual because it might not be all that it, uh, uh, it is meant to be. You see something that's spectacular, amazing. It, it has a lot of dazzle. It has a lot of sparkle to it. And, and, and what happens, people oftentimes are mesmerized by other things, impressed by certain things, and that these fascinations oftentimes can cause a person to be drawn away. So, 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 so Jesus, what happens, Jesus identified a little different than the others. You know, when Jesus was speaking, here he was, even at 12 years old, he was in the, in the temple asking and answering questions to these people that were scholars. He, he were asking questions and answering questions that had them amazed. But who's looking for him? His mama. His mama was looking for him. His mama uh, uh, was looking for him. And his brothers were with the mama, looking for Jesus Christ. And, and he said, uh, Jesus, your mama is looking for you. Your mama want to talk to you. Where you been? Your mama... And, and your daddy and your brothers and sisters, they're worried about you. 
And then one said to him, he said, your mama. And he said, but Jesus answered, said, he said, who is my mother? Who is my mother? Then he said, who are my brothers? Wait a minute. Don't you know your, wait a minute, Jesus. You must have really lost it. You forgot who your mama is. He said, he asked the question, who is my mama? He said, your mama's out there looking for you. He said, well, who's my mama? What's her name? He said, he said, who's my mom? He said, your brother's out there. He said, who's, who's my brothers? Now, it would appear that Jesus lost his mind. And, and what happened, and when he said that, he stretched his hands towards his disciples. He pointed them out. He said, here are my mother. Here's my mama. Here's my mother. And here are my brothers. He said, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven, these are my brothers and my sister and my mother. So when he pointed to all the believers, he said, he said, this is my family here. He said, these are the people that I consider to be my family now. Now, you see where we headed? We begin to see now they are part of the household of faith. He said, now I'm dealing with, I'm bringing them into my intimacy. I'm bringing them to my, uh, in, into a place of intimacy with me. This is my family. This is my family. So, 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 so with that, as we begin to look at, Jesus. Now, I'm going to have to cut some of this because I want to make just a couple of points. But look at how the Lord deals with relationships and how the Lord uh, looks at us as being a part of the relationships. He, he said, he said uh, in one instance, he talked about uh, how, how you call, he said people that were not even a people. He said there were times you weren't even a people. I like that scripture. He says, there was a time that you weren't even a people. I've called them my people when they were not my people. And in fact, he said, they were not my people. That, that's Romans 9, 25. You were not my people, but I called you my people. Let, let's stop there for a moment. I called you my people. In other words, I prophesied to you. Mm -hmm. I said, you are my people. Wait a minute. He said, you will be my people. You are my people who were not my people. I've called, but the call was for them to become my people. He says, and her beloved who were not beloved. I've called you beloved even before you were the beloved. I, I, I called you before you were brought into the relationship. And he says, and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you're not my people. There they shall be called the sons of the living God. So I'm going to make a people that's not a people, my people. And then what happens, they shall be called. You see, I've called you already, my people, but then they shall be called sons of the living God. The time will come when these that have become, that are called my people will become sons. And sonship has to do with maturity, has to do with being able to understand and comprehend the will of God and being able to flow with the will of God in ways that let's say a person outside the will could not flow. So, so, so in this, God brings us into that kind of relationship. He brings us into relationship. And when he brings us into that relationship, understand he sees us as, uh, we are seen as Christ is seen. Last scripture, the last scripture, and I wanna deal with this because it deals with marriage, it deals with relationships, it deals with family. I believe it kind of puts it all into one, uh, uh, you know, the old thing where he says, if, uh, a man shall leave his father, mother, shall be joined to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. He no longer two, but one. And he says, what God has joined together, let no man separate, let no man separate. That's God's way of joining us. He joins us. Let no person separate what God has joined. But then it goes on. Uh, it, it talks about marriage. But then he deals with the relationship within the church here in 1 Corinthians 6, 15. He says, do you not know that you are, your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Because what happens when you're joined to? Now, I'm making a point here is because we understand how we can be joined. You got to be careful what you join yourself to. Be careful when you're connecting yourself to and what you see, whether it be for political advantages, whether it be for social gain, whatever, you got to be very careful what you're joining yourself to, because when you join yourself to that, you become one with it. In other words, the sins of that which you become one with becomes your sins. 
You see, you inherit the sins. You, you see, we understand that the, the, the grace is upon you to inherit the righteousness that is there for those that are righteous. But then you can inherit the sins of those that you join yourself to. He says, so now should I join myself to a harlot? Because certainly if I do that, I become one with the harlot. I become one body with her. He said, for the two, he says, shall be one flesh. But he is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So we have to be very careful when we join ourselves to. Now, now with that, we got to be very careful. We talk about kinship. Uh, you see, you are identified as a result of a family that you have joined yourself to. Uh, going back to Sunday's message, we got to be very careful that we're not so politicized that we will we will we will uh, so join ourselves to a political party that whatever is said or done, or whatever character uh, may be portrayed, that we just dismiss it because of the fact that we want to make sure that the relationship that we have is so intact that we cannot in any wise be critical of it. You see that? We got to be careful in that. Because if we do that, you become one. In other words, you are partakers of the sins of those that are engaged in sin. That's what we talk about. A father must make sure, you see, as fathers now, we must make sure that we are uh, uh, maintaining that standard of righteousness so that uh, if we have a different standard, we are, uh, we are that, that propensity is there for our children to also take part in the things that we may be doing. So, so with that, when we begin to look at, I see the first thing I look at is the character of the individual, not the mistakes he make, or the, uh, let's, say, uh, let's say the things that he may do as a result of lacking in the area of knowledge. The thing that we must pay very close attention to is character. We must pay very close attention to character. And if the character is corrupted, very careful that we do not join ourselves with that which has been corrupted, because it's very, it's more than likely that corruption, the Bible talks about bad company corrupts good behavior, that the corrupt character can become contagious and you'll begin to see it become widespread. I, I've seen it happen so many times in churches where, where the pastor was, uh, was, was not living a godly life and was hiding sins and doing all kind of other things. And that thing broke out within the whole congregation. And understand, we look at the same thing that happened within a family, the same, see, the fathers, you hear me now, be very careful because what you're doing, you're inviting those spirits to also attach themselves to your children if you are engaged in secret sins. And the same thing applied to the nation. If we see that things are corrupted, don't try to excuse it. Don't try to dismiss it because you want to still be joined or connected. But understand, call it what it is. Call it what it is. And pray that God will begin to deal with hearts. The Bible says the heart of the king is in the hand of God. But understand, he can turn it any direction that he desires to turn it. And he can turn it for our good. Good can come out of it. But that doesn't mean that we elect a king that we know is corrupted but make sure that we make wise decisions in relation to character. What is, you see, so we talk about the highest moral ground. Let's deal with from the perspective of character. Let that, becoming the, let that become the overriding factor. And then pray that this nation would turn back to righteousness because there are many contributing factors that have brought us to a place where now our normal has become that which is against God. Our norm, the norm, let's say, enculturated. It, it has become that which is against God. And understand, it's going to take uh, righteous people, men and women, who understand God's intentions and understand God's purposes to pray and to act upon uh, uh, what God is saying, what God is speaking, in order to turn this thing around. So we pray that. You understand what we're saying here. We talk about connected by kinship, that I'm concerned about our people. I don't want to see our people manipulated. I don't want to see people manipulating our people, you know, where they can pull the chains and get you to operate uh, in mass 
uh, as a mass mind. That's what Dr. King talked about it, a mass mind to move you in one direction, any direction that, that, that uh, or any trend, you follow trends and you just say and do what everybody else is saying. But let's seek God for what is right and what is righteous. And let us pray that, that somewhere down the line, we'll begin to see this nation, I'll talk about this Sunday, as being not equal to God, but under God, under God, submitted to the standards that God has in fact established. So let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for helping us to see and to know, to understand as being your people, the position, posture we ought to take as being sons, daughters of the Most High. I pray that uh, we'll see a turnaround in events that they would occur. And it's not based upon a political party. It's not based. And Father, I pray that we will not allow one individual to, uh, as a, uh, one Antichrist spirit or any spirits to take over the whole, uh, the whole uh, environment and the whole agenda, but be in a place, Lord, where we will stand up to, to whatever the enemy will try to bring against us. The Bible says when the uh, enemy comes in like a flood, that you will raise up a standard against him. And Lord, let that standard of righteousness be that standard. So we thank you for the faithful ones that are committed to your cause. And we give you the honor, praise, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Trust that you receive this word and understand. I'm, I'm being very careful uh, as to what I say because I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to politicize anything. But at the same time, if I don't speak the truth, woe be it to me. What, how would I stand before God with a clear conscience, lest I speak the truth, but I speak the truth in love. We pray for those that are offenders of the truth. We pray for them. We pray for the compromisers, those who have sold out, and there's a whole lot of sellout that's taking place today. But we pray for them. And you know, because a lot of selling out is taking place among my people. And it grieves my heart to see it happen. I'm just being very honest with you. It grieves my heart to see people that I love bowing their knees to false gods, not even knowing that these are spirits that's causing that kind of thing to take place. So let's continue to pray that eyes will be open and that we'll see this nation turned around and we'll see our people. Yes, not, not, not murdering one another, not uh, demonstrating, yes, but not at a place where they're uh, engaged in any kind of violence or violent behavior, but the kind of protest against evil that is necessary in this day. But more than the protests, the prayers and the petitions that need to go forth to God, because only he can turn things around for us. Amen. Amen. So we just pray, if you have not given your heart to the Lord, be a part of our family. We invite you to be a part of our family, the family of God. There are privileges, there are benefits when you have surrendered your heart to the Lord, not just joining the church, but being joined to Christ, and then being connected to a people, a body of believers, so that you become a part of that company of believers to pray together and seek the Lord together. I would mention to say there are a lot of people that are joined the church, but they're not joined to the church. You see, they've not submitted their whole hearts and surrendered their whole lives to it. So if you're not joined to it, it doesn't take much. Any little offense is sufficient enough to get you to, to go in a different direction. But when you're joined to, let me tell you something. I'm just gonna give you a little secret here. My wife will attest to that. When you're married, you're going to have some disagreements. You're going to have some challenges. And you're going to reach points within your marriage. You're going to say, did I make the right decision or not? But when you join, there's no decision to be made any longer. 
the decision that you made is decision that you're to stay with. You're joined together. That which God has joined together, don't you separate what God has joined together. God did it. And God will do the correcting if you both surrender your hearts and your lives to him. So look at when we're loosely joined, how easy it is to dismiss ourselves from one another. Same way in the church. If you're loosely joined, then you can divorce yourself from a body of believers very easily and act as if you were never part of the family of a body of people that you were once a part of. And you can go join somebody else and say, I'm so glad that I got freed from the bondage that I was in. But that's what God joined together. And you left what you call bondage to be a part of what really is bondage if you did it on your own. See, God doesn't do that. You see, his bondage is when you have to live with your conscience, knowing that you've offended God and you have to carry that into eternity. So I, I, I'm saying this for a reason. So the same thing when it comes to your being joined within the body of Christ, you need to be joined by the spirit of the Lord. Where does God want you to be? And don't let anybody, anything, any allurements separate you from that. So we invite you, first of all, to be joined to Christ, to give your heart to him. And then if this church is where God has called you to be a part of, we invite you to be a part of our family. So if you have not given your heart to the Lord, let's pray this prayer together. Father, thank you for the opportunity of hearing your word. Thank you for the grace that's being extended to me now that I don't have to be alone, but you're inviting me into your family. Thank you that your son died and paid the price for my redemption, but you raised him from the dead. Therefore, I can receive new life in Christ. So I ask, I invite Jesus into my heart and I invite him to live his life in me and to live his life through me. So I receive salvation now by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed in a minute, welcome to the family of God. And if we are the family that you're to be joined to, welcome to Cross Culture Church. Let us know who you are so that we can uh, get to know who you are and to walk with you because it's not just a matter of being a church member, but being rightly joined that you may grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord. So let us know who you are and let us, uh, I'd like to speak to you personally and welcome you into the family of God as also to into Cross Culture Church. Amen. Amen. Uh, we'd like also, if you were watching tonight, a part of our Bible study, let us know who you are so that we can uh, mark you present. we just like to know that you were watching. It's as if you were sitting in our congregation, sitting in the sanctuary. Uh, those that are watching, not, not uh, I, you know, I remember some people would sit way up in the balcony and kind of hide out. And I didn't know they were there. And they say, oh, I've been attending your church for the last 10 years. I never knew that they were there. Why? Because they were hiding. Don't hide. Let us know who you are. Because we're not, we're going to bite you. We're going to welcome you. And we're going to appreciate the fact that you thought enough of Christ and you thought enough of us and the word in us to be a part of the study tonight. So let us know who you are. Just mark your presence uh, as on the screen or email us, like us, however you might do it. I don't know all these modern ways of communicating, but you probably know more than I, but we'd like to know that you are part of the study tonight. And let us now also prepare our hearts to give unto the Lord as we present to him his tithe and an offering to the Lord, thanking God for his goodness, his mercy, his love. And I just want to appreciate you again for your faithfulness, your faithfulness over these last few months. It's been a good while now, six months. We've been going through this pandemic this COVID-19, and you've been faithful. Uh, those of you that's been giving on a regular basis, we just want to appreciate you again for your faithfulness in your tithe and offerings. And tonight, as you give, I just want to pray a prayer over you that God will bless you abundantly. And you know, God can do that. He can still bless you in the midst of a drought, midst of all these crises going on. The blessings of God can still flow your way. 
So, Father, as we prepare to give, I speak a blessing over each household, each family, even the word that's spoken concerning family and kinship. My prayer, Lord, that it will take root within the hearts of each person and each family. I pray that even as we give together, that your blessings will be poured out upon our homes and to the degree that we will uh, have sufficiency in all things because you can do that so that there's no lack, but yet you can put seed into our hands, seed for the sower, yet at the same time bread for our food. So bless now, we give you the praise and honor for all that you've done and all that you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless. And uh, if nothing else, let's continue to pray. And and we're going to continue to pray for uh, our, our the family, Sister Betty. We just continue to pray. Sister Betty Robinson's family. Let's, it might have been announced already, but we just want to pray for the family. She is dear sister that uh, uh, always on the early morning prayer call and going to miss her dearly. But we're going to continue to pray for the family uh, during this time, uh, our bereavement. So let's uh, be dismissed. Father, as we leave this time of study, we pray that your blessings be upon us all, that we will walk in victory, and that you will keep us in perfect peace as we keep our minds stayed on you. So bless now, we give you the honor, the glory, and all the praise in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless, and we'll see you on Sunday morning, 10 o'clock.